Okay, so in the past lecture, we were in a stateless type of web application. What is the time.com? Just answer the time and we didn't need any database or any information, external information to answer that question. But now we're going to get into a stateful web application called myclothes.com. And myclothes.com allows people to buy clothes online. And there's a shopping cart when you navigate myclothes.com. And we're having hundreds of users at the same time. So all these users are navigating the website. And we want to be able to scale, maintain horizontal scalability, and keep our application web tier as stateless as possible. So even though there's a state of shopping cart, we want to be able to scale our web application as easily as possible. So users, that means that they should not lose their shopping cart while navigating our website, that would be really bad. And maybe also have their details such as address, etc., in a database that we can store effectively and make accessible from anywhere. So let's see how we can proceed. You'll see it's going to be yet another fun but challenging uh, discussion. Okay. So this is our application and I'm going to go fast. Here's the kind of architecture we've seen in the previous lecture. So we have our user, Route 53, multi-AZ ELB, auto scaling group, 3AZ, very basic. So our application is accessing our ELB and our ELB says, all right, you're gonna to talk to this uh, instance and you create a shopping cart. And then the next request is going to go not to the same instance, but to another instance. And now the shopping cart is lost. And the user says, oh, there must just be a little bug. I'm going to try again. So he adds something into the shopping cart and it gets redirected to the third instance, which doesn't have the shopping cart. Uh, so basically the user is going crazy and say, wait, I'm losing my shopping cart every time I do something. This is really weird. Myclothes.com is a bad website. I don't want to shop on it and we lost money. So how do we fix this? Well, we can introduce stickiness or session affinity, and that's an ELB feature. So we enable ELB stickiness, and now our user talks to our first instance, adds something into the shopping cart, and then the second request goes to the same instance because of stickiness, and the third request also goes to the same instance, and actually every request will go to the same instance because of stickiness. This works really well, but if an EC2 instance gets terminated for some reason, then we still lose our shopping cart. But there is definitely some kind of improvement here thanks to stickiness and session affinity. So now let's look at a completely different uh, approach and introduce user cookies. So basically, instead of having the EC2 instances store the content of the shopping cart, let's say that the user is the one storing the shopping cart content. And so every time it connects to the load balancer, it basically is going to say, by the way, in my shopping cart, I have all these things. And that's done through web cookies. So now if it talks to the first server, the second server, or the third server, each server will know what the shopping cart content is because the user is the one sending the shopping cart content directly into our EC2 instances. So it's pretty cool, right? We've achieved statelessness because now each EC2 instance doesn't need to know what happened before, the user will tell us what happened before. But the HTTP request, they're getting heavier. So because we send a shopping cart content in web cookies, we're sending more and more data every time we add something into our shopping cart. Additionally, there is some level of security risk because the cookies, they can be altered by attackers maybe. And so maybe our user may have a modified shopping cart all of a sudden. So when we do have this kind of architecture, make sure that your EC2 instances do validate the content of the user cookies. And then the cookies overall, they can only be so big, they can only be less than four kilobytes total. So there's only a little information you can store in the cookies. You cannot store big data sets, okay? So this is the idea. So this works really well. This is actually a, a pattern that many web application frameworks use, but what if we do something else? Let's introduce this concept of server session. So now instead of sending a whole shopping cart in web cookies, we're just going to send a session ID. That is uh, just this one for the user. So we're going to send this and in the background, we're going to have maybe an elastic cache cluster. And what will happen is that when we send a session ID, we're going to talk to an EC2 instance and say, we're going to add this thing to the cart. And so the EC2 instance will add the cart content into the elastic cache and the ID to retrieve this cart content is going to be the session ID. So when our user basically does a second request with a session ID and it goes to another EC2 instance, that other EC2 instance is able using that session ID to look up the content of the cart from Elastic Cache and retrieve that session data. And then for our last request, 
the same pattern. The really cool thing with Elastic Cache, remember, it is sub millisecond performance, so all these things happen really quickly, and that's really great. Um, an alternative, by the way, for storing uh, session data, uh, we haven't seen it yet, it's called DynamoDB, but I'm just putting it out here just in case you know what DynamoDB is. So it's a really cool pattern here. It's more secure because now Elastic Cache is a source of truth and no attackers can change what's in Elastic Cache. So we have a much secure, much more secure type of pattern and it is very common. So now, okay, we have Elastic Cache, we figured this out. We want to store user data in a database. So we want to store the user address. So again, we're going to talk to our uh, EC2 instance and this time it's going to talk to an RDS instance. And the RDS is going to be great because it's for long-term storage. And so we can store and retrieve user data, such as address, name, etc., directly by talking to RDS. And each of our instances can talk to RDS and we effectively get, again, some kind of multi-AZ stateless solution. So our web our traffic is going great. Our website is doing amazing. And now we have more and more users and we realize that what of most of the thing they do is they navigate the website. They do reads, they get product information, all that kind of stuff. So how do we scale reads? Well, we can use an RDS master, which takes the writes, but we can also have RDS read replicas with some replication happening. And so anytime we read stuff, we can read from the read replica and we can have up to five read replicas in RDS. And they will allow us to scale the reads of our, uh, of our, uh, of our RDS uh, database. There's an alternative pattern called write through where we use the cache. And so the way it works is that our user talks to an EC2 instance it looks in the cache and says, do you have this information? If it doesn't have it, then it's going to read uh, from RDS and put it back into Elastic Cache, so just the information is cached. And so the other EC2 instances, they're doing the same thing, but this time when they talk to Elastic Cache, they will have that information and they get a cache hit, and so they directly get the response right away because it's been cached. And so this pattern allows us to do less traffic on RDS, basically decrease the CPU usage on RDS and improve performance at the same time. But we need to do cache maintenance now and it's a bit more difficult and again this has to be done application side. So pretty awesome, now we have our application, it's scalable, it has many many reads, but we want to survive disasters, we don't want to be striking, stricken by disasters. So how do we do? Our user talks to our root 53, but now we have, have a multi-AZ ELB. And by the way, Route 53 is already highly available, you don't need to do anything. But so for our load balancer, we're going to make it multi-AZ. Our order scaling group is multi-AZ. And then RDS, there is a multi-AZ feature. Uh, the other one is going to be a standby replica that can just take over whenever there's a disaster. And Elastic Cache also has a multi-AZ feature if you use Redis. So really cool. Now we basically have a multi-AZ application all across the board and we know for sure that we can survive an, avail an availability zone in AWS going down. Now for security groups, we want to be super secure. So maybe we'll open HTTP, HTTPS traffic from anywhere on the ELB side. For the EC2 instance side, we just want to restrict traffic coming from the load balancer. And maybe for my elastic cache, we just want to restrict traffic coming from the EC2 security group. And from RDS, same thing, we want to restrict traffic coming directly from the EC2 security group. So that's it. So now let's just talk about this architecture for our web application. So we have discussed ELB sticky sessions, web tier, a uh, web client for storing cookies and making our web app stateless or using maybe a session ID and a session cache for using Elastic Cache. And as an alternative, we can use DynamoDB. We can also use Elastic Cache to cache data from RDS in case of reads, and we can use multi-AZ to be surviving disasters. RDS, we can use it for storing user data, so more durable type of data. Read replicas can be used for scaling reads, or we can also use Elastic Cache, and then we have multi-AZ for disaster recovery. And on top of it, we added tight security for security groups referencing each other. So this is a more complicated application. There's three tier because there is the, the web tier, the, the client tier, the web tier, and the database tier. But this is a very common architecture overall. And yes, it may get, start to increase in cost, but it is okay. At least we know the trade-offs we're making. If we want multi-AZ, yes, for sure we have to pay more. If we want to scale the reads, yes, for sure we'll have to pay more as well. But it gives us some good trade-offs and architecture decisions that we have to make. So I hope you liked it, and I will see you in the next lecture.